I'm Nate Lind, and I help people interested in buying or selling online businesses get the transaction done without the deal falling apart. If you're looking to buy or sell online businesses, then be sure to keep tuning in for more videos like this one. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications about new videos and interviews. And introduce yourself in the comments. Are you a buyer or a seller? Enjoy the interview. Hey everybody, Nate Lynn here. Thanks for joining us. I brought back Marvin Baker. He was recently on the YouTube channel and, and on the Buy Sell Summit earlier this year. And uh, had a number of people asking about his 13-point uh, checklist. So I thought what we would do is, uh, is dive into it. So we've got a list of Marvin's uh, buy side due diligence checklist. Marvin has been in M&A for many, many years. Marvin, why don't you give us just a, a really quick recap for those that may have missed those other videos. Uh, share just a, a quick background about yourself and then let's dive into your 13 point checklist for evaluating sure. businesses. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I am a fundamentally an entrepreneur, you know, grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Uh, Went to college to get out of out of the restaurant business, really, and got out of college. Got back in the restaurant business and bought and sold a number of restaurants over the years, a number of years back. And then from there, I got into just uh, broader general consulting. I uh, had uh, was a partner in a couple of different uh, CPA firms, and uh, been doing a wide range of uh, business consulting for really the better part of twenty years, Nate. And uh, a lot of that has been focused. Uh, particularly in the last five years on e-commerce in particularly, but really my background is due diligence for all types of businesses and the principles around it are fairly similar, but obviously the, the uh, unique elements of a lot of e-commerce companies come into play differently. So, so that's sort of a very broad sweep. I've uh, done literally, I uh, both had a, when I, I was an owner of a very large brokerage firm a number of years back and, and have involved in a variety of um, transactions, several hundred transactions directly, um, you know, and uh, both from SBA lending to venture capital participation and so forth. And uh, really was in the buy side due diligence uh, almost exclusively for a number of years. And then out of that, a lot of the people that struggled with due diligence sometimes came back around and said, gee, really, if you could help me prepare my business going into due diligence, sometimes that's the better bang for the buck because, uh, you know, it's sort of like I use the analogy of you know, getting your house inspected before you sell it. You're better off dealing with the issues on the front end than you are having them, you know, come up and do diligence. So that's sort of the broad perspective of where I come from. I'm a deal guy in the sense that I approach due diligence from the point of view of trying to make it a, a valuable process for everybody involved. Uh, and if we find problems, which are most of the time, then our objective is to, to, uh, look at what the alternative solutions are. So we, we don't just raise an issue and kind of create a stop point. We really try to say, hey, this is an issue and we can do this, this, or this. So that's more philosophically where I come from, whether that's on the buy side or the sell side, is trying to uh, you know be, be thorough in identifying issues and then uh, finding creative ways, if necessary, to kind of overcome them where we can. And so, Marvin, you see your baker's dozen, your 13-point checklist is mm -hmm. something that both on the sell side, pre-listing and pre-sale that a seller can use to get his business ready. And then also on the buy side, something a buyer can use to validate uh, that they're getting what they're expecting uh, before going to an asset purchase agreement. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair to say. And in both instances, again, we're trying to add value to that proposition. So it's, it's a uh, I think really, I think that anyone going to market that's not really going through some sort of a process like this uh, generally is leaving some money on the table. That's my view anyway. Okay, very good. Well, the first one I've got on here is infrastructure, burden and value. You want to walk us through that? Actually, uh, maybe what I can do, let me do a quick uh, screenshot here and share screen and then I can show kind of everything. Uh, do, 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 do. This super quick. All right, grab that. Uh, I'll do a quick share screen here, and then we can kind of talk through this. So we got something kind of visual, other than our shiny faces, which I'm sure everybody watching wants to see. Sure. Okay, that's helpful. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm getting ready to load this thing up. Okay, so I think no matter what, and they don't necessarily fall in any particular order necessarily. I think what each one of them does, and they don't, they are all sort of uh, chapters in the book of, of the analysis, if you will, whether it's a buy side due diligence or sell side due diligence, 
um, in each one of these elements, uh, some of them are very in-depth analytical required. Some of them are very brief, you know, engagement with them, depending upon the nature of, of the company and the circumstances that we're in. Uh, but, it, but in every instance, what we're trying to determine is whether this particular attribute or part of the review, if um, out of it is something that adds value to the business, in other words, enhances the value, supports the value, a positive element of the business, to figure out if it's a negative, is how can we make it a positive? And if it's positive, how can we increase it, you know, or make sure that we, if we're on the buy side, that we capture it um, as, part of the, uh, as part of the process and not lose it in the process. In terms of infrastructure specifically, the burden and the value part is that if you go back in time, um, you know, you, with bricks and, more, bricks and mortar kinds of companies, infrastructure is sort of a normal, heavy infrastructure is frequently a normal part of a business analysis. And uh, frequently you can look at it and say, hey, that's the overhead, that's the fixed cost as it relates to the business, we call the burden part. Um, on the other hand, the expectation is that the infrastructure should be adding value. And if it's not adding value, then it's simply burden with no real you know, value justification for it. An example of that might be a restaurant business in a bricks and mortar scenario, where it's got a super location you know, in a downtown high traffic a spot. And so the infrastructure at that point in time has a, built-in traffic you know generator or things of that nature as part of it so that location can be positive another same restaurant in a different kind of location the restaurant's been passed by it's no longer a great place to be you still got the burden associated with it but you lost a great deal of the value so that's simplistic as it relates to a bricks and mortar but when you get into e-commerce companies we frequently think that we don't have any infrastructure and that's rarely the case or if it is the case it's rarely the best set of circumstances, because the infrastructure really is that part of the business that doesn't require the owner to be there, for example, doesn't require for it to be um, something that can't operate um, or is in danger of, of losing its edge in the marketplace, the products alone or the value. So infrastructure in a positive point of view ought to be that part of the business that, that is the permanent element of the business that adds value on an ongoing basis or grows helps grow the business. So. So how it specifically relates to a particular business depends upon the business, but it's a place we look at because we want to come away from it and say that infrastructure, if it exists, is it valuable? And if it doesn't exist, can it be added? Should it be added? And, and finally, that part of it is, is that how, how much of a, a, a long-term liability does it represent? And in the, we get into the financials a little bit, you know, infrastructure sometimes can be positive in the short run, but if you got a 20 year lease in a deteriorating location, for example, then that burden becomes more burdensome and less valuable over time and ultimately can become maybe an anchor to the business. Uh, so that's sort of any questions about that, Nate, or is that pretty clear? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask for an example. You know, what came to mind for me for an e commerce business, you know, we, we see a lot of that here at Website Closers. Um, so I'm thinking of an example where, you know, maybe an e commerce entrepreneur has a warehouse and they're doing fulfillment out of their own warehouse. Uh, in some cases, uh, I'm thinking two different scenarios. One where it's just for themselves, and one where maybe they've also got some third party revenue. Maybe they're doing some fulfillment for a couple of buddies' companies or something like that. Where, where do you see that on the, on the burden versus value uh, well, scale? I think, it, I think it, that's part of the analysis is, is that where does it fit there, right? And I think your point is well taken, but I think also another way that I look at is that Amazon is infrastructure, right? In other words, if you have a business and you're an Amazon seller, uh, if you take your business outside of Amazon, you lose that infrastructure that Amazon presents. So you always have to be cognizant of what you have in terms of the value of the Amazon infrastructure, right? And what's the burden, you know, and where's that fine line? Is that is that um, a valuable part of the infrastructure or is it a burden, you know, more burdensome than, it, than it's worth? So that's the more, more uh, clearly defined place that we don't often think of, of it as being infrastructure. But to your point, when you add a warehouse or you add an office or you add uh, maybe your own shipping capabilities where you're delivering or things of that nature, all those points are, com are committed and, and, and we consider them to be infrastructure normally is when you're committed to them for longer than a month to month basis, right? 
So if you're committed to it for a year or more, you know, and even though you can move out of Amazon, you can't move out of it with changing your business model or losing your business model. So you're committed to it almost in perpetuity. Uh, and so it's an infrastructure piece and you've got to look at it that way. Uh, same thing with the warehouse that you're talking about is does it add value? What are the alternatives? Is it a burden in excess of what it can be replaced for? That's part of the analytical that we're looking at and saying, what does it bring to the table? Because every bit of a business complexity that you add, you add a level of risk as well. So you gotta be sure that it's adding value and not just simply adding you know, overhead. So, so is the layman's test kind of, uh, you know, is it is it adding value or is it uh, just uh, a, I don't know, you see like a redundant or or a uh, an expense that could be cut. Is that is is as simple as that? I'm sure, I know it gets well, more complicated. It's, what, I, what I do with it normally, Nate, when I do with these is I tend I tend to to grade them on a scale. You know, the scale usually around that one to five scale, and with three being sort of a neutral. You know, it doesn't really add. It doesn't really detract. Maybe it's a necessary part of it, but you don't really see it as really adding significant value to the business higher up it goes on that scale, the more value it's added. So easiest analogy, again, is going back to a restaurant analogy, super high location, you know, high traffic location uh, in that scenario. So it has, it has high value and it, above and beyond the building itself or the infrastructure, the other infrastructure itself. So, so we're, we're, we are gauging that value and trying to quantify, qualify it and saying, okay, very high value, are very low value. And if it gets below with the three scale, and it's somewhat subjective, but when we get there with it, then we're saying it's taking away from what I would consider to be the more quantitative valuation of the business. We're saying, hey, this business is a, if we've got two businesses and they're making the same amount of money and we apply the same level of multiple to them because they're so similar, but if the, if the one has a higher value infrastructure uh, versus the other, the fact that they are the same or have similar histories, the one with the, with the more valuable infrastructure is going to edge it out in terms of the value analysis of the business. Okay. So, so it's scalar in that way. In terms of branding, one of the things I always look at with branding is, you know, you're, we're most of the time dealing with entrepreneurs, so in entrepreneurial businesses. Um, and so it's really important normally for them to have a clear distinction between the branding for the company and the branding, you know, for the individual products. So you can be the Coca-Cola bottling company, but you know, you may have Sprite and Diet Coke and multiple products and each one of them have their own branding element associated with it. So, and the, and the, the, to the degree that the brand individual brands again, add value. If they are uh, a product that is, has a, an element of practicality to it. So when I hear the name of it, for example, I know exactly what it is. That level of, of branding is very important. If I own that, meaning you know, I've got a, a, a proprietary right to that name and that name clearly you know, explains the product in such a way that the consumer immediately gets it, knows what it does, and that's a very high value branding element associated with it. Uh, to the degree that it's been in the marketplace and has, you know, history behind it and a lot of people that know the brand and things of that nature, obviously, those are elements of high value branding as well. Uh, on the other hand, if we've got products that, that are doing well, but they are very generic in terms of, you know, they've got no real protections around them, the name itself doesn't really add any particular value, then it probably doesn't or won't normally grade as high on that scale of the value of that individual brand. Ultimately, you know, the more value these kinds of things can contribute, um, the stronger the revenue expectation is because it's a it's a moat, you know, around the around the product, around the brands associated that help defend it against you know the competitors. So so we look at it that way and we make judgments about both from a corporate point of view and a product branding point of view. Now, do you see the organic um uh, poll or the organic marketing aspect of a strong brand, like it's it's social media presence, um, you know, it, it's word of mouth, uh, that sort of stuff. Does that fit under this under this category? Yeah. yeah. So if you go, you know, the, one of the major differences between say, you know, Google ads and Amazon ads, you know, or at, what happens with Amazon. The big you know, one of the big differences that I find with them is is that. You know, Amazon is looking to drive a straight line, right? In other words, if I come on to Amazon and I, what Amazon wants me to do is they want me to say, 
hey, I want, you know, a Clorox wipe, right? That's what they want. They want me to search for a Clorox wipe. And they're going to, if I search for a Clorox wipe, then Amazon is going to shoot me directly to Clorox wipe. You know, that's what they're going to shoot me to. They're not going to send me on a circuitous route to get to Clorox wipe. They, they want me to go there. Not only do they want me to go there, is they want me to purchase when I get there, right? So they want me to, to purchase along, you know, immediately. That's a successful transaction as far as Amazon is concerned. They don't want me to go to Clorox wipe and then search for, stand, you know, a different kind of a Kleenex wipe or something like that. They don't want me doing those kinds of things in that regard because it's it's not the way they're built. So they're built for me to come in, you know, go to where I'm going and, and, and immediately, you know, purchase. That's the ideal Amazon transaction from their point of view. Whereas on Google, you know, I may say, gee, I want a, a, uh, a wipe that has a, a bleach, you know, a bleach element associated with it. And I may get in bleaches and I may get in all kinds of sideways kinds of things before I get to that Clorox wipe, you know, that I was looking for to begin with. Or I may not know Clorox wipes. I may not know the brand name, you know, even though that may be what I, what I want if I knew all the elements associated with it. So to that degree, um, when you've got a message that needs to be told, I think what you're relating to, right? You've got a product that needs to be explained and you need to have a product that needs validation in the marketplace where social media can immediately give you that kind of a thing. To the degree that you've got a history behind that, that's a high branding element, obviously, that says we've got a following, we've got people that, are, that, that know me, that trust me and, and, and trust my advice so I can ask them and I can you know, count on the, the advice I get from them. So those are all valuable branding elements depending upon the nature of the product and service you're providing i, I all, would all uh, those things add to value right and so they, and if we don't have those kind of things and those are value opportunities um and and, and but they were the fact we don't have them you know it's lower on that scale of, of, the, of the branding value at that point in time some big value adders i hear buyers looking for you know in the transactions that i've been facilitating this year, uh, definitely reviews. So Google, you know, Google reviews, of course, Amazon reviews, uh, you know, anything on any of the social media platforms, uh, all, you know, there are layers building on that branding, uh, adding value. Yeah. And I think what really, and that's a really important point. And I think in that regard is, is that what you're looking for there in terms of brand value as well is that when the reviews reinforce sort of the branding strategy, right? So if I've got a branding strategy and a name that takes me down this pathway and my reviews are coming in, they may like my product, I had a good experience, but I'm also looking at is, is that, is there a direct relationship there that my branding strategy is aligned with my reviews that are coming in? I'm succeeding in my branding strategy and it's being reinforced by that. So, so to the degree that we can see evidence of that, the greater value we feel like the brand has. The, uh, the final point I was going to make on branding, too, is uh, the, the nature that your, uh, your trademarks will have in creating an offensive moat for your company, your trademarks, any patents, um, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, on the Amazon platform in particular uh, is critical. And then also even on Shopify and the other platforms, you can use those to take down, um, you know, lookalike competitors and that sort of stuff, which. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're and that's the moat to your point, the protective devices around it and the more protective devices you have around it, the more ownership you have of the brand and the more ownership you have of a great brand, the more valuable it is. So yeah, ab absolutely. That's a, that's a really good point relative to that. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to subscribe and tell me what you thought about it in the comments. Your comments encourage me to continue posting videos and they give me ideas about what to post next. I read and reply to every single one. Also, if you own an online business and you're curious of how much it's worth, Click the link below to get a free business valuation with a member of our team. Who knows, it may even be me you're talking to.